Welcome to Computer Science E1. My name is David Malin, and this is lecture 10, website development. Unfortunately, it took us 10 lectures to realize that um, I am not, in fact, qualified to teach this course. Uh, you will recall, perhaps, from lecture 1 that we introduced this course and its entire slate of lectures with this photo here supposed excerpt from a popular mechanics magazine in 1954 that was a mock-up, we said, of what scientists thought the home computer might look like 50 years thereafter. Well, I got a little visit from Ray Diaz this weekend, and he handed me the uh, manila envelope, unmarked, with a, a bit of paperwork in it. And of course, when you meet some guy late night on a bridge and he hands you an unmarked envelope, this is never good news, right? Well, the news that he handed us is that, um, this turns out to be a hoax. In fact, what you're looking at is a photo that was submitted to a fake photo contest, which ended up being circulated via email and the internet and other venues for the past year or two. Um, in my defense, I will say that people far grander and smarter than I have fallen for this. And in fact, I did my own research in my own defense. Uh, we have an article here from uh, New York City, December. Those coworkers who constantly clutter your inbox with email forwards aren't the only ones who have fallen for a recent internet hoax involving a fictitious 1954 popular mechanics article. It appears two savvy software CEOs have also been taken in by the Photoshop handiwork of a Danish computer company employee. A manipulated photo of a mock submarine console passed off as a 1950s projection of the 2004 home computer was even used by Sun Microsystems chief executive officer Scott McNeely in his Oracle open world keynote speech yesterday in San Francisco to illustrate how rapidly technology improves. And this past fall, Lotus founder Mitch Kapoor posted the image on his blog before later posting a correction. In fact, the photo on which this mock-up is based is this, which is a photograph of the inside of a mock-up of a submarine from the Smithsonian Institute. Now, I wish I could say that this is a good defense, but um, this uh, news release of the fact that this was a hoax was published about 356 days ago. So even that's not a very good defense. So my props to Ray for uh, diagnosing this and for discreetly um, putting me to shame here so that I could take the blame myself. But we have been duped, I have been duped, I have duped all of you, and so sadly those two security lectures in which I pointed my finger all too many times at not believing internet forwards and just deleting things you receive, well, it appears that I don't even practice what I preach. But we will try to forgive, we will try to forget, and we will move on tonight to an incredibly exciting lecture, all of which will none of which will be based on emails I have received. Tonight we will teach you Greek. And by Greek I mean something that may, might as well look like Greek to you. For instance, I'm going to go ahead and pull up, let's say, uh, give me your favorite website, anyone. Google, I heard. All right, so Google.com. Well, Google is a terribly simple site, probably doesn't take much to engineer the aesthetics of this simple home page, but recall that in this class we've many a time gone up to the view menu of our browser, we've gone to source, and we've just very quickly glanced at what makes up this page. So in fact, there's not all that much, and it's a small font I realize, but that's just as well since we probably couldn't make much sense of it now anyway, but notice that it's fairly cryptic. There's a lot of angled brackets, there's lots of slashes, but there's mentions of some keywords that we've even heard about already in this course, like HTML, and then there's a tag called body, a tag called head, and we'll revisit those today just to um, spur the conversation along towards something more complicated. Let's take a look at CNN, which we've similarly looked at before. If I go ahead and pull up this page's source code, which we've done before, notice that it looks kind of the same. All these open brackets, closed brackets, and so forth, but this page is clearly much longer. And you've all seen in class before CNN's web page. There's more content, certainly, than Google's home page. Well, I say that we're going to teach you Greek tonight because by the end of class, you will know how to read and write this sort of text. Perhaps not in the length as is offered by CNN's website, but ultimately you will speak by classes in the language known as XHTML. And it is in precisely this language that web pages today are written, and it is precisely by the end of this course that you too will have the savvy to create web pages looking like most every type of website out there today 
albeit with the caveat that only with time and practice can you really produce works of beauty. But with that said, who would like to learn how to speak Greek tonight? Me. All right. Excellent. Well, let's motivate this discussion a little bit by first thinking about, it's sort of ironic that this photo looks a bit like a submarine console, isn't it? Well, let's talk about the notion of a web server. So you've been using a web server all semester long. What web server have you made use of, hopefully, um, profusely, particularly in the end of October, as I recall? Yeah, harvard.edu, specifically www.fas.harvard.edu. So just to recap some jargon, edu is what, using the nomenclature of this class? Top level domain, harvard.edu is what? The domain, you could call it a subdomain, but conventionally we would just call that the domain. Uh, what about fas.harvard.edu? The subdomain, and then www? Uh, the host or the host name. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff in there, but it's all hierarchical. So tonight our focus is not on fas.harvard.edu, which recall is not only a subdomain, but it's also the moniker for the SSH server to which you've been connecting. But if you are even more precise and say www.fas.harvard.edu, what you will end up doing is connecting with, say, your web browser to the machine or the machines that comprise FAS's web servers. So what is a web server, just in layman's terms? You've all used it. What is it? OK, it's a bank of computers. What do they do? OK, so they hold information that gets presented on your screen as a website. What language do these web servers speak with browsers? OK, either HTML of some variant. Uh, in a sense, and we'll make this distinction clear tonight, when a web server is communicating with another web browser, what is the language that we've always said they speak across the wire? HTTP. So that was hypertext transfer protocol. Well, tonight we're going to focus on the first part of that acronym, hypertext, because HTML is hypertext markup language. So it's in HTML, hypertext markup language, that web pages are written. But it's in HTTP, hypertext transfer protocol, that they are delivered and requested and exchanged. So what is the relevance to our tale? Well, www.fas.harvard.edu is a web server, which means it's a machine, or it's a collection of machines. Or more properly, it's a program running on a machine. But we often just equate the notion of a server as a program with a server as a physical box. So we have here on campus at least one machine that is called www.fas.harvard.edu. Well, it turns out that on this machine, you all have some storage space. Because in fact, the hard drives used by the www web server is the same as the drive space used by your SSH accounts. So when you have SSH to fas.harvard.edu, even if you've only done this once, maybe twice in the class, thinking this is not a very useful system to use, well, starting tonight and starting with the newest problem set, you'll be making much greater use of your FAS accounts. Because inside of your FAS accounts is 50 megabytes of storage space. You are allocated, according to your username, 50 megabytes of storage space that you can store emails in, MP3s in, lecture notes, but more to the point tonight, web pages in, and graphics in, and anything you ultimately want to present on your web page. So suppose that this web server has one or more hard drives on it. They're quite large. We're talking many gigabytes, if not terabytes at this point, given that FAS supports tens of thousands of users these days. So there's going to be a sort of hierarchy to the folders or directories on this web server. And in the world of Linux, we usually call the root directory by a single character, just forward slash. In the Windows world, what do we usually call the root of a hard drive? Your C drive. When people talk about their C drive, or I say open your C drive, that usually means go double click on your C drive, which more specifically means open the default folder on your hard drive, the so-called root folder. And it's a root in the sense that it's the origin of all other folders that you might have stored 
on your hard drive. But recall in the world of Windows, whenever you see C, it's usually followed by a colon, but it's also followed by a slash. In the world of Windows, it's a backslash. In the world of Linux, it's a forward slash. But the point is that they're both the same. They denote the root of your hard disk. OK. Well, on FAS, there is, in the root directory of the system, and I'll do a bit of simplification so that we can fit everything nicely on the board, there's at least one directory. And this directory is quite simply called home. And home denotes the folder in which everybody's home directory is stored. And again, your home directory is just your personal storage space for anything you want to put in your FAS account, email, web pages, anything. Inside of the home directory is a bit more of hierarchy. There is, for every letter of the alphabet, a directory, the first of which starts with A, the last of which starts with C. Inside of each one of these folders is another letter of the alphabet. So we'll go down here, for instance. Um, we'll put an M in the middle as well. But there are many other, 23 uh, other directories in between. So beneath each one of these folders is another such hierarchy, where you have an A directory. And then you have a whole bunch of other things. And then you have a Z directory. Beneath that, you have folders for every username on the system. In other words, since my username on the FAS system is Malan, M-A-L-A-N, that means that my home directory is, of course, stored on the hard drive in the root, but more precisely inside of the root's home directory, but more precisely inside of the home directory's M folder, and even more specifically, inside of the A folder inside of that M folder. In other words, inside of this A folder, among many other folders, is quite simply a folder called Malan. And again, folder and directory, these are synonymous terms. And it's finally this thing that constitutes my home directory. So when you log into fas.harvard.edu, as you've done with secure CRT or other programs in the past, if briefly, and if the teaching fellows had you type the command ls to list the contents of your account, what you were seeing were the contents of this folder. What we will be doing starting tonight is creating Scary as this might be, yet another depth to this tree. But we're pretty much going to stop here. And the directory we will be creating tonight and in sections and workshops over the next few weeks is a public HTML directory, Qu quite uh, called quite literally that. The word public followed by an underscore followed by HTML, all lowercase. By definition, most web servers that host multiple users, as FAS does for you, have users store their web pages in a public HTML directory, which, as the name suggests, is a directory for HTML that is public. The reason for this is that inside of my mailing directory are other directories. For instance, inside of here is also a directory called mail, where all of my email is stored. And there might be other folders that I have created to store works like homeworks, or maybe essays, or letters, or really any kinds of files I want to store in my account. You don't want to make your home directory public, because that would mean everyone could access your emails and everything else. And so we isolate, starting tonight, all of our web work to one directory called public HTML. And this is true on most web servers based on Linux or Unix. The Windows world works a little differently. But if you ever, in the future, are working with a Linux or Unix system with web pages, and you have a user account on it, most likely your web pages will be stored in here. But that is a simply a default system configuration that most systems use. But it's relevant to most systems these days. With that said, what's going to go inside of here? Well, the stuff we saw overhead a moment ago, which again I said was an example of HTML, is precisely the content that is going to be going inside of this folder tonight. Specifically, if you want to create a web page, you will be putting that web page as a text file inside of this directory. Well, let's go ahead and make this a little more real. I've just logged in via SSH to my account, and I have my blinking prompt. So you've probably seen this before in section workshop or perhaps on your own. If I typed ls, you would see everything that I have in my home directory, the email directory and so forth. But what I want to do tonight 
is for the one time only, and you only have to do this once, and this is the sort of thing you don't need to write down tonight because we'll revisit this in section, workshop, and in an online handout. But the one command you will have to type tonight, or at some point soon, but never again thereafter, is mkdir for make directory public HTML. When I hit enter, nothing appears to happen. But in the world of Linux and Unix, that's usually a good thing. If you don't get an error message, something good happened. What good happened is that I can now type cd, which stands for what? Change directory. And then I can type public HTML. And sometimes some systems will put a slash on the end of folder names. It doesn't mean it's named with the slash. That's just a visual cue that that's a directory and not a file. But it doesn't need to be there. If I hit Enter, notice what happens. I get a new blinking prompt right after that colon. But what has changed parenthetically? Yeah, you see this tilde slash public HTML. And this is the reason that if many weeks ago we had you, when you got your FAS accounts, or if you haven't done this already, you will for this upcoming work, we had you type a program called E1 Setup, which was a program that essentially reconfigured your prompt and did a few other things. By reconfigured our, your prompt, I mean it added this helpful visual cue in parentheses that tells you in what folder you are. right? Because when you don't have Windows, and icons and menus to click on, it's just a blinking cursor. And that's not all that informative as to where you are on your system. But in parentheses, with all of the work you'll do in this class on your web pages, in parentheses will you see your current location. Suffice it to say for tonight that if you're not in that public HTML directory, you're in the wrong place. So you're not going to have to be moving around a lot, but what you won't be able to do is put web pages anywhere other than this directory. So that is a good thing if you see a blinking prompt after public HTML. Well, here we go. I have a blank prompt. If I type ls, nothing happens, which is a good thing in a sense because no error happened, but there also seems to be nothing in this directory. ls lists the files in the current directory. It's the Unix equivalent of the dir or dir command if you use that in the world of DOS or Windows, but it's in this directory that I need to now create a file. The program that we will use in this course to create web pages is perhaps the simplest there is on a Linux system. It's called Pico, think little text editor. To run Pico, you simply at the blinking prompt type Pico, all lowercase, and hit Enter. Think of this as the Linux equivalent of Notepad from Windows or Simple Text on Mac OS. So now I have. And again, a blinking prompt. But now I'm in an environment where I can hit Enter, I can type around, and so forth. This is actually a text editor. I could now save that as a file to the local hard drive, print it, email it, whatever. But the point is that it's a very simple text program. On the bottom of this program, cryptic as it might look for the next moment, are a list of menu options. So you've all probably forgotten at least once that you can't use the mouse, really when you're SSH to FAS. And you can click all you want in the screen, but nothing actually happens. The most you can maybe do is highlight, which may or may not be useful. So what this caret symbol suggests is the control key. So what this is saying is if you want to exit Pico, you will hit Control X. And if I do that now, you'll see what happens. You get a prompt saying, uh, somewhat cryptically, save modified buffer. And then it tells you parenthetically that saying no would be bad. It's like saying no, you don't want to save. But at this blinking prompt, if you simply say yes, you will be asked for a name of the file if you haven't provided one already. So I could say myfirstfile.txt. And then I could hit Enter and save the file. You can always, in Pico, hit Control c to cancel whatever you're doing. And then you can go back to your typing and editing. What we'll be doing in this class is not writing cryptic looking stuff like this, which is clearly nonsensical, but the other cryptic looking stuff that we called HTML. And so let's, with this program, whip up our first web page, which you've actually seen me do before. This isn't going to be a perfect web page, but it will be a web page in 30 seconds. This will be Done. Our first web page. Okay? The last thing I hit was cancel, just so I wouldn't actually save and quit. But what I'm going to do now is this. I am going to save this file. And to save a file, you can hit Control-O to 
for output, and it's saying what file name to write. Well, the only reason it's asking me this is because I didn't specify a file name when I first started the program. But what is the name of the default file for a home page on a web server? In index.html. So we've seen this before. Recall our demonstration from weeks ago that we can visit CNN.com and get the day's news, or we could visit CNN.com slash index.html and also get the day's news. The reason being, if you don't specify a file name, most web servers assume you mean the default file, which usually is index.html. So I'm going to say, save this as index.html. I'm going to hit Enter. And now it says, wrote how many lines were in the file. How do I get out of this program? Control X exits. So now I'm back at my blinking FAS prompt, as we'll call this, or the blinking Linux or Unix prompt. Well, now what I can do is go over to my web browser and visit www.fas.harvard.edu slash tilde, whatever my username is. And I logged in as Malin, so I'm going to type Malin and then enter. And what you see is, hi. Well, where is the text we typed exactly? It's terribly small, terribly ugly, but at least it works. right? That's at least a start, as you've often felt in section. If it works, at least that's a good thing. So notice that we see high exclamation point. But I also thought I typed hello in this file. Where do you see hello? Exactly. So it, it's a little small for this screen right now, but in the very top left of the screen, it says, hello, exclamation point, dash, Microsoft Internet Explorer. And that is the so-called title of the page. Well, where did we see that? Well, in the file I wrote, notice that hi, exclamation point, appears in the body, and hello, with an exclamation point, appears in the title. So just using some intuition here, that's why it appeared as it did in the web page. And this is perhaps the simplest of web pages you might ever write, because in a nutshell, every web page must have a head and a body, which this page does. It's terribly uninteresting, the content we put in that head and the body, but it did get the job done. And so what we've just done with respect to this picture is added one other thing, which is not a directory, but is a file a very simple text file called index.html. And I'll draw it with an ellipse to denote the fact that it's not a directory, but instead a file. Well, that's it. HTML. What do you think? OK, so not so hard when you see it in fairly simple context. And the thing about HTML is that, yeah, it might look remarkably daunting if we set out to say, we're going to make this by the end of tonight. But the fact of the matter is, by the end of tonight, we'll have introduced most of the building blocks that are inside of this file so that using some very simple heuristics, some very simple building blocks, you can build up what currently is an incredibly simple page into something much more interesting. Now, this. The making of web pages is something that is far more fun and interesting to do in a hands-on sense. And so in lecture tonight, what I'll try to emphasize is the concepts and the overarching ideas. But it is not important tonight, I think, if you walk out the door and can um, enumerate for us all of the various tags and markup that exists in HTML with which you can make web pages. That is the sort of knowledge that you can put by your side with a reference book or the handout. Or more to the point, in the upcoming sections and workshops, you'll work with a computer in front of you and a teaching fellow by your side or in the front of the classroom, and you'll actually learn this stuff by doing it. And I think it's at those contexts or at home working off the lecture videos or the section handouts that this will really sink in. So tonight, our goal is a conceptual one. And we'll launch now into a discussion of what you can and cannot do with HTML and why I am sometimes saying HTML, why I'm sometimes saying XHTML. But there's one last detail we need to mention with respect to this hierarchy. Most likely, at some point in the semester that remains, you will get, you didn't see what I just typed, you will get the following error. You'll have just made a web page, a file ending in .html. You'll then go to your web browser. And you will refresh the browser so that you can see the changes you've just made. And you'll get this message, forbidden. Well, that's kind of scary, right? If all of a sudden you're being forbidden access to your very own content. 
But that's usually to be expected, because the first time you create a file, usually by default, only you have permission, in a technical sense, to look at it. If you want to make it truly public, it's not sufficient on most systems just to put it in this directory. You also have to change its permission settings, if you will. You need to change, it's like the equivalent of saying, uh, getting the properties of a file by right clicking on a file in Windows and choosing properties. You can change who can see a file in that regard. Well, on these Linux systems, what you'll type in this class is a very simple command, fix web files which for now think of as a beautiful black box that when you execute it, it fixes all of these permission problems. In short, what it does is it makes sure that everything in your public HTML directory is viewable via the web. So in short, if you ever get an error message like this, you can most likely fix it by running this command. Fix web files, which normally is not so slow. which really should not be so slow. And in the tradition of Julia Child pulling a baked cake out of the oven, your problem will go away. <laughs> okay, We'll take a look as to why that was taking so long. But it will work. And then if you go back and refresh, then you will be granted access to your web page again. So with that said, with the hierarchy of the FAS system enumerated, and with our emphasis on the fact that in this course, you'll connect to your home, SS, you'll connect via SSH to FAS, you'll type what command to move into here? CD public underscore HTML. From there, you'll be sitting in your public HTML directory as though you double clicked on it and opened it. Every file you then create in that folder will then be sitting at this level. And provided you run fixed web files, it will be viewable on the web. In fact, suppose I do this. If I very quickly make a new file called um, new.html, if I very quickly whip up another title, um, let's see, new, close title, close head, and I'll explain what I mean by open and closing all these things in just a bit, body. And just to spice it up this time, I will say green. But it's no fun if all I do is say green. I'm actually going to go up and add a little something crazy here, which says that. OK, I'm going to save and quit. I'm going to go up here and not type index.html, because that's the first file. This time, I'm going to say I specifically want not the default file, but rather new.html. And there we have it, my ever so slightly better web page that's green because we changed the background color of it. So with that said, now let's try to provide some of the building blocks unless there are any questions on the structure of a web server. Anything at all. All right, so here we go, XHTML. HTML, let's say, is a lazy man's version of XHTML. HTML is, of course, the language in which web pages are written. HTML was invented by Tim Berners-Lee some years ago. In fact, the inventor of the internet, uh, the inventor of the World Wide Web, is the inventor of the World Wide Web in the sense that he invented the language in which web pages are written. Initially, HTML was meant as quite literally a markup language, a means by which researchers and academics and others could very easily post information on the internet without using other protocols that existed at the time, like Gopher and FTP. I mean, we all know that perhaps the easiest view of the internet for many of us comes by way of a web browser. It's point, it's click, it's visual. You don't have to log in. It's not something more uh, cryptic looking like secure effects and so forth. In short, it's just easy. It's an easy way of accessing information on the internet. Well, that's all HTML was meant for. HTML was not meant in the beginning to start creating works like this and websites of yet more complexity. HTML evolved over the years to support what we'll call tonight new tags that facilitated different features, blinking, <laughs> different colors, things flying around on the screen, bats fluttering about on a web page on Halloween, and all of these sorts of things did not exist in the early 80s and thereabouts. These have been more recent enhancements. And so in fact, what we discussed tonight is what's called HTML4, version 4, or really XHTML 1.0. 
because I said a moment ago that HTML is sort of the lazy man's version of XHTML. And XHTML, to be more precise, is the language in which good web pages are written. Or rather, web pages are written by good people, shall we say. A lot of web pages today are still written in HTML, but as you'll see tonight, and even through experience, HTML is much looser and much lazier about being clean with one's code. Think of HTML ultimately as a language in which you can write sentences and forget things like periods and commas and syntactical details that fundamentally don't really get in the way of getting the point across, but they certainly leave your work looking a little less clean, as it might. This then is a sample XHTML page. And you have this as a printout in tonight's lecture notes. It is incredibly similar to what we just did with just a few additional lines. And the reason that I didn't type the first three lines into our demonstration is because I can never remember the syntax precisely myself. I mean, this is a lot, those first three lines, to memorize. But technically, every web page written in XHTML, as it should be for this course's purposes, needs to start with those three lines. We have facilitated the process by which you can output those lines with a special command on FAS that you can type. It spits that stuff out, and then you do the rest, simply to save time. And I'll demonstrate that in a moment. But beneath that so-called doc type element is the stuff that we already introduced tonight. Right? We have this so-called HTML tag. We have this head tag, this body tag, a title tag. And then we have slightly different text, but the idea is the same. In fact, if I pasted this content into my index.html and refreshed, describe verbally, if you would, what that web page would look like. Perfect. The title of that web page would now be hello, comma, world. And the text in the body of the web page would be hello, comma, world. So in short, every web page written in XHTML, which stands for Extensible Hypertext Markup Language, so it's HTML but with extensible in front of it, must start with that. And in fact, it must have every one of these tags. I said earlier that every web page must have a head and a body. This page does as well. But even to be more precise, every web page must start with an HTML tag, must then have a head tag, must have a title tag, must then have a body tag. But I'm omitting some other tag. So even though I haven't quite defined it, what do you get the sense a tag is? Yeah, a tag defines something. It's like a container. And anytime you open a tag in XHTML, you have to close it. And the syntax that the world decided upon is that this tag we would call an open tag because it starts with an angled bracket, has a keyword, and then a closed bracket. Hence, it's an open tag. We call this thing here, though, a closed tag because it has that same keyword with an open bracket, closed bracket, but a forward slash in front of it. So perhaps needless to say, to open a tag, you just write the tag's name. But to close the tag, you simply write the tag's name with this forward slash. It's as simple as that. And the rule, as this example suggests, is any time you open a tag in this language, you must eventually <coughs> close it. Moreover, you have to do it in reverse order. For instance, if I open the tags HTML, head, title, I must then close them in the reverse order. The most recently opened tag must be closed first so that you have a sort of symmetry or balance. So notice, open, 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 close title, close head, Open body, close body, close HTML. So you close things in the reverse order so that, again, things are balanced or symmetric. Well, let's take a look at a slightly different example. I just hit the key. I changed slides. But this thing looks almost exactly the same. What has changed? The body tag has changed ever so slightly. So this is still the body tag. And we usually call tags by the keyword that begins them, even if there's stuff after the tag's name. So body is now really not just the tag, but it's the name of the tag. We notice we have a space here. And then this thing called BG color equal sign, quote, unquote. And then inside of that, this cryptic looking string. Well, let's tease these things apart. BG color is an example of something known as an attribute an attribute. It's like a feature or characteristic of a tag. More specifically, an attribute typically controls the behavior 
or the display of a tag. So you saw this a moment ago. If briefly, BG color stands for what? Background color. Whoa, see, easy questions tonight. So background color. So what we're saying is set the background color equal to quote unquote something. The rule in XHTML is that every attribute must have an equal sign after it, and then the value of the attribute, as they say, must be flanked by quotation marks, either a pair of double quotes or a pair of single quotes. It is fine, however, to include some extra white space in here. For instance, I could have said BG color space equals space, quote unquote, and then that cryptic looking string. In short, XHTML doesn't really care about white space so much, but we try to keep things clean, and this looks pretty clean. It isn't really necessary to add some spaces here. But let's just hone in on this value here. This value we saw earlier, it stood for green, but why in the world does this make the background color green? Chris? OK, good. You're on the right track. I'll steal some words and rephrase. So these are hexadecimal codes. Hexa stands for 16. So the hexadecimal system means that you can use up to 16 different digits. Well, let's relate this to other base systems we've used. We've talked about decimal in this, in this world. Right, what does the decimal system use? What digits? Right, 0 through 9. You use this every day. Binary uses zeros and ones. Hexadecimal uses what? Perfect. 0 through 9 for the first 10, and then 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. But in reality, I shouldn't have said it that way. This is 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, because we started counting at 0, even though f is the 16th digit. OK. Well, that seems to be out of the way. Hexadecimal, OK, sure, colors. But why does 00, zero which is like nothing, followed by FF, which sounds like a lot, it's two of the highest values possible. In fact, FF, recall from our discussion of monitors, actually denotes 255. Though if you're not quite sure why, don't worry so much tonight. But then 00, zero which is, again, not much of anything. So what does 00, zero, then FF, then 0, 0 denote exactly. Perfect. Red followed by green followed by blue. Have you ever heard this acronym before? RGB? Even if you haven't, think back maybe 10 or 15 years ago when maybe in school or at work you had those projector screens, which you might connect a VCR to. Those projector screens were not these you know, tiny little $2,000 devices that we have today, but rather these big monsters that the kids would sit in front, at least my friends and I would sit in front of in history class when we would watch VHS movies, because what those projectors had was a circle, a circle, and a circle, which was a red lens, a green lens, and a blue lens. RGB, because with those three colors, if you unite the color schemes as a single focal point, you can essentially create any color you wish. So what happens here is that the first two digits in any such number scheme denote how much red you want. These two digits denote how much green you want. And these two digits denote how much blue you want. So if you don't want any red, give me no red. If you don't want any blue, give me no blue. If you want a lot of green, use the highest possible value two Fs. And with this scheme, you can come up with any color, pretty much. And in fact, how do you know these colors? Well, it's pretty easy to figure out what the code is for red. What would the code be for pure red? Right, FF0000. Blue would be 0000 FF. What would peach be? Right, it gets a little tricky. And so this is when you start Googling around for uh, color charts, or you look at the back of one of the recommended textbooks in this course, and you look at the colorful pictures that tells you pictorially what color maps to what code. You'll find, too, and we'll play with this perhaps later, that a lot of web browsers do understand some basic colors. You don't, I didn't have to write, quote unquote, sharp 00FF00. I could have just written, quote unquote, green, because green is a pretty simple color. I could have written blue. I could have written white, black 
purple, yellow, any of the most basic grade school colors. But if you want to get a little more advanced than that and get a particular shade of yellow or a lighter shade of red, then you have to turn to color codes, usually. And you can look those up. And in fact, Photoshop has a means, and you can play with this in section, it has a very pretty color wheel that you can click on and choose the color you want, and it will tell you the hexadecimal code for that particular color value. So that's another neat way of doing it. Correct. If you're not using a hexadecimal number, do not put the number sign. You just put quote unquote green. But if you are using hexadecimal numbers, put the number sign. Yeah. So, so the pound sign indicates that you're about to use a hexadecimal. Exactly. The pound sign indicates that you're about to use a hex code. People will say hex instead of hexadecimal often, incidentally. OK, so just to recap, very simple example. But this time we have a body tag being modified by one attribute, the value of which is Dollar, uh, number sign 00FF00, which denotes green. And clearly, that attribute is significantly changing the behavior of the body tag because it is making it, in fact, green. You'll notice at the bottom of a lot of tonight's slides, those small on your printouts, does tell you where on the web you can access these very examples. So you could, of course, retype these into a web page, but we've already made them all accessible on the course's website. So if, for your own reference and for our use tonight, we go to lectures, and we scroll down to lecture 10, and go to the demos link for markup. You'll see a whole bunch of files. And the one relevant to that example just a moment ago was bgcolor.html. And so we can see the results without, without having to type it up ourselves. And the first example was called hello.html, and it was even simpler. But we're working our way up. We're working our way up to some slightly more interesting examples, and here's one such example. Clearly more content here. You tell me, what do you think this web page will look like? Hello world will be in the middle, I hear, and, and in blue. Not in italic font? in size 7, whatever that means. So that's a pretty good start. In fact, let's try to do this verbally now from top to bottom. So the top three lines have to be there. They should never change. And in fact, you'll probably never have to type them. We'll help you generate them to save you time. This you do have to type, or at least it must be there. You have to have a head. You have to have a title. What you put in between the title tags, open and close, is entirely up to you based on what you want the top of the page to say. Close the head. Open the body. Here's a new tag. Take a guess. What might div stand for? Division. That's exactly right. The div tag implies a new division of the page. What that means exactly will entirely depend on the attributes we put on it and the content we put inside of it. So let's see what's going to happen here. So in this division or part or portion or segment of the page, call it what you wish, we are going to align everything in the center. What other values might we put here? It's so simple. Left, right, center. So a lot of the times this will be common sense, but a lot of the times it suffices, again, to look at a little cheat sheet that, such as those will provide to you, or in a reference book, or eventually it will just sink into memory what is allowed. What's next? Well, notice, for instance, that I've all this time been doing this nice little indenting that kind of tells you what's inside of a currently open tag. None of this white space, as it's called, none of these spaces or tab characters, none of the carriage returns I've inserted by hitting Enter, none of them are strictly necessary. HTML ignores white space beyond one individual space. So all of the indentation and the so-called pretty printing that I've done in this example is purely for human readability. It is easier to read this code than it would be, for instance, to read that code. This is the same code we had before in new.html. I've added some color just so that it's easier to see the different tags this time. But that is new.html. I stripped out a lot of the new lines. I'm going to go ahead and save it. I'm going to go back to my web page and type in tilde mailin slash um, new.html. And incidentally, whenever you're accessing a specific user's home directory in a browser, you put that tilde right before the username. 
Hit enter. What changed? I saw a head shaking, which is good. Nothing. But if I look at the source in IE, whoops, <laughs> refreshing, hit refresh. If I look at the source in IE, the source has changed. But the fact that I removed some of that white place really reveals to us that it was superfluous. HTML, the browser was ignoring most of it. And as an aside, this is a good opportunity to point out a common mistake. Many students, when first learning this sort of stuff, will write their web page in, for instance, Pico in this environment. They'll save it, maybe go back to their blinking prompt. They'll then refresh the page to see what it now looks like. And then just out of curiosity, they'll view the source, as we did, and they'll see this. And then they'll decide, oh, you know what? I want to go ahead and say green with more exclamation points. And maybe they'll go up to file and save. And then they'll refresh and then be a little bit confused. I mean, I'm sort of making fun of it here. But talk to me in more technical terms about why what I just did was incorrect. Sorry? You were in the text editor to make the changes. Well, I was in Notepad, which is a text editor. And it was clearly the source for this same web page. Right. So what is happening when you go to Internet Explorer or any browser's, browser's view source menu is what you're looking at is the copy of the HTML that was transferred to your browser via HTTP. I then change that copy, sure. But unless you actually change the original on the server, you're making no real effect on your web page. So it's important, of course, to keep that distinction clear. Silly as it might be now, when you're banging your head against the wall late at night trying to understand why these changes aren't showing up, it could be something as simple as that. Well, let's continue with our tale here. We have left off where we said we have a division of the page that is to be centered. And fortunately, with HTML, a lot of it you can just learn by example. You don't need to take a course on HTML. You don't need to read a book really on HTML. You really just need to look things up when you need to know them. Or you can infer by examples. Take a guess what these three lines are doing. Exactly. It's saying the size of the font. It's saying the style or face of the font. And it's also saying the color of the font. The name of this tag is, of course, what? Font. And that is a tag that's defined. You can't make up your own tags in HTML. Right? You couldn't just say, this is my uh, David tag, and David's BG color attribute will be blue. You actually do have to stick with the predefined tags in the language, but font is one of them. Among the allowed attributes in HTML or XHTML are color for this tag, face for this tag, and size for this tag. For whatever reason, size is defined in XHTML to be a relative notion. Seven means really big. One means really small. Everything in between is relative to those. So we don't mean seven point. Because if you think about Microsoft Word, for instance, seven point is tiny. And one point is just unreadable. This is relative. Seven is actually pretty big on a web page. One is small, but readable. OK, blue, of course, is the color of the web page. I could have replaced this with, though, the number sign followed by what? Good, 0, 0, 0, 0, FF for all blue. Face. So in the face tag in XHTML, you can actually list one or more fonts if you have it. So what's your favorite font, for instance? Anyone? Garamond is a nice font. And in fact, it is the course's unofficial font used in all of the printed handouts. What else exists? Verdana, Arial, Helvetica, Times, Times New Roman, Courier. These are all popular fonts that most computers have. But you want to be careful, because some of you have fonts that I don't have and that other users don't have. So just because you have a font on your computer and the web page looks fantastic on your machine while you're developing it, if you specify, for instance, the scary Halloween fonts name here that you happened to download last year to make some poster, well, the web page will look great and will look scary on your machine. But on someone else's machine that doesn't have that spooky Halloween font, the browser will just pick some random font. And it will probably look pretty ugly. So typically what people do is they don't specify a specific font unless it is one that is so popular and omnipresent, like Times or Courier or Arial or Verdana or Helvetica, that is pretty much known to be on any computer. 
they don't use this at all. Or they more generally say, make this a sans serif font or a serif font. What's, what do we mean by a sans serif font? Right, sans is without. Serif means little cute uh, tails, for instance, on a font. So a sans serif font would be something like a font that would draw a T like this. A serif font would might draw the T something like that, and a little more pizzazz to it, a little more frills, particularly on the corners or edges. So in this way, I'm guaranteed to get sort of a very cold, clean looking website with no frills, and that's usually a useful thing because, for instance, on the courses website, we do mention sans serif for the font in which everything appears. Because at this font size, which is relatively small, we don't want to make it yet more unreadable by having little frills on the font. So that might be the motivation. Or you can leave the font face specification off altogether, let the browser decide. But the default font for most browsers is what, do you think? It is times for most computers, which tends to be kind of ugly on computers, if only because it is the default and too many ugly websites make use of it. Most folks will move to something like a sans serif font or Helvetica, Arial, Verdana, anything that looks a little cleaner than that, particularly at smaller sizes. Well, we're not quite done yet. We've just said that all of this stuff in between the open font and the closed font tag, which is hello world, should be blue, without frills, and in seven points, in seven relative size. Well, what do you think this tag is? It's a break, a line break. It doesn't suffice in XHTML to just hit enter when you want to insert a new line. Consider, after all, what happened when I deleted all of the carriage returns before. It made no obvious effect. In fact, let's go one step further with index.html. Notice it looks like this. Notice that I had this empty line there before. And yet, when I visited the page for my index.html, there's no blank line. And actually, this is not great because there is some default blank space there. But you would think, if I did this, there would be more. I'm going to save with Control O, refresh, nothing happens. In fact, if I go to the other extreme and not using line breaks, but rather spacebar characters and say, um, dog, cat, save it, refresh, you see dog space cat, to be expected. If I go in between here and do this, you might think, OK, well, that'll put cat on the right-hand side of the page. But again, XHTML ignores anything more than a single white space. So I could even go in here and say that, which just looks ridiculous. But in the web page's view, it looks the same. Ergo, we need some way of forcing line breaks to appear. And the means by which you can do this in XHTML is by saying BR. Save, refresh, and now we have our intended line break. Yeah. Indeed. So with some features of XHTML, it doesn't really make sense to have an open tag and a closed tag. Consider, after all, how would you break up the notion of a line break into a starting point and a close point? It's more of an atomic notion. It's either there or it's not. And so what this open bracket, br slash close bracket means is insert a line break immediately. It's sort of a dual open tag, close tag altogether. You could, and you would not be incorrect, do this, br, and then close br. But this just looks kind of silly. And it kind of suggests room for mistake, because if you wrote something like hello in here, what does it mean to start a line break, say hello, and then end the line break? Where conceptually would the hello actually appear? So it wouldn't really make sense. And so what most people do is use these so-called atomic elements or tags that are simultaneously opened and closed. But you'll notice I did something curious a moment ago. I actually left a space in here, even though I didn't in this example. Both are correct. And it is a good idea, in fact, to get into this habit, leaving a blank space before the slash in any tag that is both simultaneously opened and closed. In other words, it's a good thing to include that space. Why do you think this might be? It's a bit of a stretch to guess it, but 
What might be the reason? Yeah. Uh, it could be a useful way to search because you could hit Control F, for instance, in your program and look for that specific sequence, which might facilitate that. Sure. Yeah. Might be easier to read, which is a valid reason when you're in this environment writing cryptic-looking stuff. The more readable, the better. You might be tempted to use a backslash, but that would actually be incorrect and could not and should not appear in the document. And so the real reason, though none of those were bad, slightly more technical, it's because with older browsers, which some people might still have, there's no such thing in their world as a tag called br slash. Old browsers know about a tag called br. So if one is writing a web page in this relatively newer language called XHTML, and you use tags like this, which are correct for new browsers that support XHTML, but they will confuse potentially old browsers that see br slash and say, I know about a br tag, but not this br slash tag. And the default behavior for most browsers, if they don't understand something, is just to ignore it. And that would be a bad thing in the context of a web page you're writing, because if you want the line break to be there, you don't want a web page to ignore it. And so the safe way to avoid ignorance on the part of old browsers is to put the space so that even when they encounter this slash, which in the world of older browsers makes no sense. Older browsers did not support these tags that were both opened and closed simultaneously. But the browser will see open bracket br, OK. That's a br tag. I know to insert a line break. Then the browser will proceed. Uh, I don't know what this slash is. It will ignore it, but it will have already produced the line break. So this is, in short, a very good habit to get into. Well, finally, with this example, we have a line break followed by a little more text from little ol and then this cryptic looking thing. Take a guess. What do these three lines collectively achieve for us? They do. This is the means by which, this is a representative example with which you can create hyperlinks in a page, specifically hyperlinks via which you can email someone. So the link we're about to describe is, of course, going to be in blue, which I wrote as a hex code this time. It's going to be in the same um, simple type font. Font size is going to be 2, which means it'll be relatively smaller. It's going to say from little ol, and then this is called the anchor tag. It's just quicker to write A instead of anchor, which is why they chose this convention. There's an href attribute, which stands for hyper reference, aka hyperlink. The value of this hyperlink is defined in this case to be mail to colon, which is kind of like our URL syntax, right? Protocol colon slash slash. But in this world, in XHTML, there's no slash slash. You just say mail to colon, the email address that you want the link to email. And then you put in here whatever you want the link to appear as. This is the destination of the link. This is the aesthetics of the link. This page is called mail2.html, which if I pull that up on our system from tonight's lecture demos, you will see the results of this page, which quite simply are that page. It's a very plain looking font, no frills. Starts off really big, font size 7, then it has a line break, some small text, font size 2. It says from little old, and then it's quite small, but notice that this is a link. If I hover over it, what do you see down here? The value of the link just says mail to colon username at fas.harbor.edu. If you click on this link, your email program will launch. It's not configured on this uh, AV machine here, but if you did have an email program configured like Outlook or Eudora, you would then get a new mail message, and you could email username at fas.harvard.edu. Relate this back to our security discussion. Recall when you receive emails that are written in HTML or XHTML, you can often be duped, like I have been recently, into thinking that a link goes somewhere that it doesn't. Because the link says one thing, but it leads elsewhere. Think now about how you achieve this. You include in such spams or phishing attacks an anchor tag with an href attribute that really goes to www.bankofthevest.com. 
dot com, but then what would you put here to trick the person into thinking it was a legitimate URL? Bankofamerica.com or even bankofthewest.com because even if it says it aesthetically, the destination is actually going to be here. And we'll see after break how you create not mail to links, but literal hyperlinks from one web page to another. Let's go ahead and take a five minute break. All right, we are back. Let's get our hands dirty with some of these new tags and topics that we've looked at. We now have a blinking prompt. What I'm going to introduce now is a special command that we have configured your accounts with on FAS so that you don't have to type out that cryptic looking three line doc type element, as we called it. The command that you can type for this class's purposes after you've connected to FAS and CD'd into your public HTML directory is quite simply a command called x. HTML. If you only type XHTML, you will not get that message, and nor should you or need you commit this command to memory. If you just type XHTML, you'll get essentially an error message saying, wait a minute, to use this program, you have to type XHTML followed by a file name. What this program, XHTML, is, is just a quick and dirty way of creating the template for a new file. So what I'm going to do is call this 3.html, because it's my third web page we're creating tonight, enter. And now notice that our program tells you the framework for an XHTML document has been placed in 3.html for you. Be sure to set its file permissions appropriately. If I type ls to list, notice that 3.html now exists. If I type pico and then 3.html, that's like loading pico and opening 3.html. And look how much of the work has been done for me. The upside then is that all you need to now do is change the title to whatever you would like by typing my title here, and then you can change the body however you wish. And it's in the body that we'll play around for the next minute or so with some of these new tags. And the title tag, incidentally, you can just have text. You can't change the font in the title. You can't make things bold. You can't change the color. It's just the title of the page, pure text. All right. What do you want to do? What do we want this web page to look like? Test my skills. You like your page blue, so how do we make a blue page? Got to be more specific. Oh, the last two. OK. Better, but still, there we go. OK, we need that. And is this font big enough to see in back tonight? Readable? Yeah. yeah? OK. All right, good. We now have a blue web page. So let's, oh, before we get more contributions, I'm going to save it with Control O. Oh, thank you. Number sign. Save it. I'm going to go back to my web page here. I'm going to go to mailin slash 3.html. OK, we're on our way. Next contribution. Large letters. I'm going to give you a new trick for large letters. If you want large, bold letters, you can use the heading tags, H1 through H6. H1 will look like this. Refresh. It's big and bold. If I change it to H6 and refresh, now it looks like this. So much smaller. And I think we're quickly realizing that a big, bold blue page is not ideal when you're using black text. So I think we should fix this. So let's use maybe not H1. How else could we make text big? Font. Size equals what's big? Seven is the biggest. OK, close tag. Now I have to counterbalance it with the appropriate close tag. Now I can refresh better. What would look better on blue? Than we could cut back on the blue just to make things more fun. What else could we do to make more of a contrast? OK, how do we make this white letters? Go back to font. Yep, more specific. Good. Good, so color equals white. What's that? So that works. Does it matter if I put color equals quote unquote white here or here? 
No, the order of your attributes and values does not matter. You just have to separate them by at least one space so that the browser can distinguish one from the other. I'm going to save this, refresh, good. Better web page. What next would you like to do? Well, let's poo, whew, put a picture, all right? <laughs> let's go ahead and do this. Um, we need a picture, so let's go to Google. Let's go to Google Images. What do we want a picture of? Sorry? A cat. OK. <laughs> we will take, do you like the sleep cat? All right. So we will take this picture. They're quite adorable. And let's see, actually. I'm going to show you one way of doing this, which is not, in general, the ideal way, but it's simpler, and we won't have to get into FTP tonight. Notice that the URL of this picture is clearly what's in the web browser's page. So I'm just going to copy that URL. I'm going to go back to Pico. And I'm going to put my image in here by using the new image tag, which for shorthand is just IMG. The source for this image, SRC, which is the valid attribute, is going to equal that URL, which I just pasted in. The notion of inserting an image is similar to the notion of inserting a line break. It's either there or it's not. So I'm going to simultaneously close this element. Notice that we kind of lost track of it, and there's a dollar sign there. Well, that's Pico's way of scrolling you to the right. If I want to scroll back to the beginning, just hit to the left, and you'll scroll that line back to the left. OK, so if I scroll to the right, I'll get the end of it. Scroll to the left, you get the beginning. I'm going to save this. I'm going to refresh my own page, which, recall, was this blue thing. Huh. Error. Why is that? Page is blue, but we seem to have a broken link there. We're missing some piece of the code, but what's probably actually happening here is that most people don't like you taking their images. And so what was most likely happening is that the web page is noticing that, wait a minute, someone from the FAS web server is trying to reference this cat on my server. I'm not going to let them capture that file via HTTP. So you would typically need to do some other mechanism, either if you have permission downloading the file locally, then copying it to your FAS account using what program do we use to transfer files? An FTP or SFTP program like SecureFX, so that you would then copy the image, the JPEG, into your public HTML directory. Let's assume for the moment that we did do that. What you would then do is not use a whole URL like this, but if the file happened to be called one of, not of that cat, if the file happened to be called cat.jpg, you would simply say that the source of the image is cat.jpg. But we'll defer to section or the workshop, the manual process of uploading the files. But you've probably done this at least once in the past, perhaps for the Photoshop section, uploading photos, perhaps, or for some other means. But we have tutorials on this. Okay? But including an image is relatively as simple as that. So let's assume for the moment that it is, in fact, there. And you know what? We can cheat a little bit so that we are not completely boring today. We can go to, for instance, our own website. OK, and the last TF to touch his nose will be the one nominated for this, which is Roman. <laughs> what I'm going to do is it's not as easy with Internet Explorer. You can do this with other browsers, figure out what the picture is called. But I happen to know that this photo is called Roman.jpg. So if I want to link to it directly, what I can actually do is if I know the URL at which it is located, if I know the URL, I know it's at HTTP www.fas.harvard.edu slash, I think it's in images, photos, staff, roman.jpg. Let's see if I got that right. And I did. Good. So <laughs> a big hand for Roman. <laughs> So there we have it. We've embedded a graphic for which we have permission, of course, in, inherent in any kind of use of images that you find on the web or issues of copyright and so forth. But I'm going to assume for the sake of tonight that I have Roman's permission to put uh, his photo on our web page here. But let's spice it up a little more. We have yet to include in a web page the notion of a link. 
Well, we saw a moment ago how to make links to email addresses, and that's all fine and good, but there are a lot of people in the world today that use not Eudora or Outlook, but like webmail, hotmail, gmail. And unfortunately, those mail to links don't work well for people who have web-based email accounts because they only trigger local software. If someone that uses Gmail clicks on a mail to link, it's not going to load Gmail, log them in, and then prompt them over with a window. They would rather have to manually copy the, the email address, load Gmail, log in, and then paste it in. Not as ideal. So let's focus for now instead on the notion of just a link, which will be done also with the anchor tag, also with the href attribute, but what's your favorite web page to which you want to link here? What's that? Hint, hint? What does that mean? Hint, hint? HTTP, how about www.bankofthevest.com. Notice that you must include for href values the HTTP colon slash slash. You must be formal about it. Close quote. Close angled bracket, what do I put next for a hyperlink? Whatever you want it to be aesthetically, so we could say click me, close anchor, save, enter. Let's go back to that page, refresh, and uh oh. It's there. So you'll see this discussion in the current problem set. If you choose a blue background, and you have a hyperlink, which by most browsers' defaults are blue, doesn't work out so well. And you'll often see, incidentally, on web pages that are trying to improve their search engine rankings, that there's going to be often a whole lot of irrelevant or bogus text that's in there, but it's invisible in the sense that it's the same color as the background. Right? If you include many more keywords in your website, but don't necessarily display them, a search engine like Google will find them, but a human won't be bothered by them. But a quick and dirty trick to see all such text is just either to highlight everything on the page by clicking and dragging or just hitting Control A which, or Command A on a Mac, which on most OSs will highlight everything, usually making everything apparent. So there's our link. We could click it. Doesn't look so good. The easiest way to fix this for now, hideous as this might be, is to do something like just changing the background color so we can see everything. Okay, it's ugly, but now we can still see the click me, not because of the photo. <laughs> if we click the link now, we go to bankofthevest.com, which looks like it's been shut down and replaced with the default page now. So there you have it, a hyperlink that goes to a particular website. Well, let's see how we might exercise some additional control, particularly over not just the color of the background, not just the color of text, but maybe also hyperlinks as well. Here we have our fourth example in style.html. And I think it's useful to note at this point that though we're writing these pages in XHTML, it's for legacy reasons that the open and close tag that begin and end the page are still called HTML. All web pages end, for tonight's discussion, in dot. HTML, but the language that you're writing them in for this class is called XHTML. Unfortunately, there's a lot of leftovers from the previous language. So with that said, here we have the head tag, title tag, body tag, all pretty boring by this point. But we have a div tag again, and this time it's going to get a little more interesting. I'm incorporating into this demonstration the notion of CSS or cascading style sheets, which is a counterpart language to XHTML, which allows you to more precisely control the aesthetics of your web page. So in fact, by the end of tonight, you'll have under your belt not only a bit of XHTML, but also this other language called CSS, cascading style sheets, which again are a way of controlling yet further the aesthetics of a page with far more power than you could with just XHTML alone. You are using CSS any time you are writing the value of a style attribute. So notice we have on this div tag a style attribute. Ergo, everything between this quote and that quote is what's called CSS, properties written in CSS. So a property is sort of the synonym or the analog in the world of CSS to XHTML's attributes. So you control the behavior of tags with attributes. You control the aesthetics of a page with CSS 
properties. Well, what kind of properties? Well, what this says here is that here's a division of the page. Put this division in the following style. All text should be aligned in the center. The color of all text should be blue. The font family to be used is, again, sans serif. The font size to be used is specifically 36 points. So already here, you see the greater power that CSS gives you. No longer are you confined to using relative sizes like 1 through 7, which are entirely browser dependent. You can say specifically, display the following text in 36 point PT. Properties are clearly separated by semicolons. You don't use equal signs to assign a value to a property. Rather, you specify a colon. So the syntax is a little bit different, but still relatively straightforward. Once you close the quote there, and you can or cannot have the semicolon, it will still work either way, close bracket, put your text, close the division. This, of course, inserts a line break. Here comes another division. This division will have the following style. Centered text, blue text, sans serif again, but a smaller font, 26 points smaller, in fact. Inside of this is the same text as before, a link that allows you to click on it to email username at FAS. The results of this page then are at style.html. It looks pretty much the same. But I have more specifically exercised control over the size of this text. So I've achieved with CSS what I pretty much achieved with XHTML. But I could have been much more precise. And in fact, just to be a little silly here, we could, for instance, if I wanted to copy this page, and as an aside, a wonderful way, frankly, of learning XHTML and CSS is to go to websites you like, and if they're not overwhelming in complexity, view the source and then start learning from their own source code. Copy little parts of it, tinker with it, understand how it works. Because most any web page you visit exposes its source code. Whether or not you can make use of the images and so forth are, again, a matter of copyright. But simply learning from the examples and then already seeing on the website itself what it looks like is a wonderful way of learning this stuff. So I'm going to temporarily just copy that so I can paste it more quickly into my fourth page tonight. I just pasted it in. I'm going to just, to make the point, change the top part not to just 36 point, but to 128 point, which is absolutely something you could not do with just, um, with just XHTML. Going back to my own page, which is here. We're going to go to 4.html. And it's really big, but precisely the point. Yeah. An excellent question. The question is, how can you create not just necessarily vertical divisions of the page with line breaks, but maybe horizontal divisions, sort of two columns, perhaps? I'll do this terribly quickly because it takes a little getting used to. But behind the scenes of most web pages are one or more tables. Tables, of course, are things that in the world of computers often have columns and rows, cells similar to Excel. In fact, if we want to. For fun here, if I connect to the E1 account on FAS and I edit the XHTML that we're using, which is actually more complicated than a typical page since we generate the pages automatically, what I'm going to do is scroll down to the very top of the page used by E1. There's a lot of code here. It's the website, as you may have seen in one of the links, is written in a language called Perl and some other languages that dynamically generate the code so that we ourselves rarely edit the XHTML on the website manually. Rather, we change one line of code that regenerates the website to update the lectures page, the sections page, and so forth. But here we have something familiar. We have an HTML tag. We have a head tag. We have a title tag. And this is, in fact, the title of the E1 website's web pages. Computer Science E1, Understanding Computers and the Internet. If we scroll down, you will see a body tag. It's a little tough to read, I know, in purple, but this will be brief. And notice BG color is all Fs. That's a good question now. What does all Fs denote? It does mean white. 
So all zeros would mean black, the absence of all colors. All, all Fs means the presence of all colors, which in the color spectrum gives you white light. Well, we have a table element here, and it's this new tag that I'll very quickly introduce. And I'll introduce it by way of example. In this table tag, which you can learn more about in section or any reference book or cheat sheet we provide, there is often a body attribute, a border attribute. Currently, it's set to 0. If I change it to 2, save the file, and refresh our own course's website, what you will see is an otherwise invisible table that we use to control the layout of the banner. We have essentially, for that banner, multiple images, all squashed, uh, squished next to each other to create the illusion of one banner, but it's really several pieces. This is how we rotate the banner without changing, for instance, the John Harvard part. We lay things out, as you suggested, as an A or a cat and a dog or a left and a right by having a two-column table. And in fact, the rest of the site similarly has a table behind the scenes. If I scroll down to the next instance of a table, we have one down here, which I will also change to have a border, refresh the page, and now you see the rest of the E1 website with tables that are effectively invisible, invisible in the sense that they have a border of zero, you can really begin to refine the layout of your page in ways that XHTML doesn't, with the examples we've done thus far, allow you to do. And I defer the specifics of this, not because it's hard, but because there's a lot of balance that you need to maintain to get it right, but it is relatively easy. And it's with, again, the table tag. So let me change this back in case anyone logs in and sees our now hideous website while we're here in class, I change those back to zero, refresh the web page, and it's back to its old self. CSS, revisited. We saw CSS a moment ago as the value of what tag? Rather, the value of what attribute? The style attribute. The style attribute can be applied to a lot of different tags, as you'll eventually see. The div tag is one of them. In this context, though, we are using what's called a more explicit style sheet. It's a style sheet in the sense that we are enumerating top to bottom a whole lot of properties and property, a whole lot of properties and values. The other place, in other words, that you can put CSS is in the head of your document. Thus far, the only thing we've been putting in the head is this title element. And that's great because it's useful, but it suggests not we haven't seen any other use for this. But you could also, either before or after your title tag, put not a style attribute, but a style tag. The value, or the attribute for it, should be type equals quote unquote text slash CSS. Though if you omit that attribute and value, most browsers will assume you're about to write in the style known as CSS. Beneath that, you can put the same kinds of stuff that we saw earlier. But in this kind of style sheet, you can override the default behavior of tags in the document. For instance, notice this. We've seen this single character before. What does the A denote? The anchor tag. So with this line of text inside of this so-called style sheet, that is between the open style and closed style, we are overriding the default behavior for the anchor tag. Specifically, we are specifying that all anchor text should be decorated with none. We'll see what that means in a moment. The font weight to be assigned to all anchor tags is bold, and the color is blue. Think back now to the default behavior for most browsers. Most links are blue and underlined. What we're saying here is that, OK, leave them blue, make them bold, but don't decorate them with an underline. So if I load this page, which is called CSS.html, what we will see then is the following. Hello world from little old me. But notice what's ever so slightly different. The underlining is gone under the me. There's no underlining under me. But notice, this is new too. If I hover over it, notice what happens. And we do this on the E1 website, right? When you hover over these links, they don't become bold because they already are bold. 
but the line does appear, which is not standard behavior, but it's a little different, a little aesthetically interesting. So how are we achieving this? Well, when we hover over this text, what's having an effect is the CSS we've defined for the hover property of the anchor tag. So we are saying, yeah, by default, make anchor tags look like this, which we described a moment ago. But in the event someone is hovering over such a tag, make it look like this. And the only difference is the color becomes red and the decoration becomes underlined. We can make this yet more explicit by doing something like this now. If I go into this file, I'm just going to copy the source so that I can play with it in my own account. I'm going to load 5.html, paste in that code, and what we'll do is this. When you hover over this link now, we're going to really make it jump out at the user. Font size is now 72 point. All right, save. And you'd be surprised how many websites actually do things like this. So now I'm going to go back to my account, mailin slash 5.html. Okay, looking pretty good. Hovering over it. Hideous, but doable. And this is the, the, the implication here is don't do this, but to give you a better sense of the actual power you can exercise using CSS. And it's a lot to absorb, certainly, the first time you see it, XHTML and its attributes and tags and CSS and its properties and values. But again, this is meant to be a cursory overview tonight of some of these concepts, a teaser, if you will, of what you can do in the future. Well, questions on some of the aesthetics we've seen, because that's about all of the tags I'm going to introduce you to, even though there are many more, none of which are particularly hard. But we're not quite done yet, though. We have some other fun stuff coming your way. <laughs> um, let me pause, though, if there are any questions on what you have seen thus far. Ah, I forgot that one, in fact. Yes, so also in this style sheet, there's another bit of syntax, which you don't have to fully absorb tonight, but just try to remember that it exists. If in a style sheet you start a line with dot and then choose some arbitrary string, like my style, what you can do is sort of predefine a style that you want to use elsewhere. So what this means is that anywhere in this document that the word my style appears in a certain way, it, that text will become centered and blue in a sans serif font. Well, where do we use that? Scroll your eyes down here, and we seem to be making use of my style as the value of a new attribute called class. So class and style are the two attributes in XHTML with which you can deploy CSS. We saw use of style in the previous example when we overrode some of those properties. But now if I want to reuse some CSS, you can define it up top as a class, which now this is. And then you can reuse that stuff, not by just copying and pasting it, but by saying, you know what, put this text in the my style class. Put this text also in the my style class, which means what can you do more easily, given this approach, as opposed to just copying and pasting the same stuff as the value of, say, the style attribute? Change things. You can change one line of code and change your entire website. And in fact, what the E1 website makes use of, which you'll see if you look at the source code to our site sometime, even though some of it's a bit cryptic looking, there is a file reference there called, actually I'll show you the source code real quickly. At the top, another way of linking to style sheets is not to paste them into the document itself, but to say, use the style, use the CSS from this file. The line I've highlighted, though small, suggests that there's a file called styles.css. We can pull that direct file up by going into the CSS directory, styles.css. It looks ugly in Notepad here, but suffice it to say, we'll look at it in the better context, the style sheets that E1 makes use of are these. We have a file in which we've defined several classes. We have an announcement class. We have a header class. We have a subheader class. And notice the first two, which are perhaps the most real or appreciable, is the anchor and the a hover 
properties. And I know it's tough to see in some of this color, and you can look at this certainly at your leisure, but what we noted earlier is that when you hover over a link on the E1 website, what suddenly appears? The underline. And we achieve that, if I can even reach, by saying for the hover property of the anchor tag that the decoration should become underlined. Whereas by default, if you look at the very first line, there's no decoration. And that's how we achieve that result. Well, there's this notion in XHTML of well-formedness. And this is a useful thing to tuck away in your mind so that you write what is ultimately correct code. We've been doing this all along tonight, writing well-formed XHTML without actually saying what it is. All XHTML tags, the names thereof, must be written in lowercase. That is a component of a page's being well-formed. Not only the tag names, but all tags and attributes in lowercase. That must be the case. Moreover, and we did say this before, all values of attributes, which I'm abbreviating with ATTRS, in quotes, either a pair of double quotes or a pair of single quotes. And finally, and this too we did say before, all tags are balanced. In other words, when you open a tag, you must eventually close it. And like we said earlier, you must close it symmetrically. The most recent one you opened must be the, most, the soonest one you close. So part of well-formedness, of course, is that you not use tags like this. Why is this a non-well-formed tag? It's an uppercase, which is obvious, and it's not closed. So the correct one would be that or that or, give me one more, even, yeah, or that. Though this is a little strange. The best way, the best one is probably door number two. So that's what it means to be well formed. One other piece of jargon with XHTML. Validity. A page is said to be valid if it can, this is going to be a scary sentence, a page is said to be valid if it conforms to a DTD, or document type definition. Well, what does that mean? A web page is valid, XHTML, if you've only used the tags and attributes that XHTML actually supports. For instance, there is, in years past, a tag called Blink, which was a tag that if you put hello in a Blink tag, you can guess how ugly your website would be. You'd have hello, 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 hello. Uh, Microsoft, I believe, and Netscape eventually put their foot down and removed support for this tag altogether. And in fact, it, only one of them at one point supported them, though it would be a curious experiment to see if we go into maybe our fifth document here, scroll down to Hello World, and let's just for kick see if Internet Explorer does like this these days. Blink, let's go back to 5.html. And fortunately, support remains disabled. But this would be an example of, even though this might work in some browsers, particularly older browsers, it is well formed, because it's in lowercase, and you have um, symmetry in the open and closure of the tags, it would not be valid because it's not a legitimate tag. And in fact, I need to go fix something that I seem to say every year and then always correct myself on. Let's try to do it in the same lecture this time. The fact that all tags are in lowercase is a requirement for validity. So I just fixed this. To be valid, a page must only use predefined tags and attributes. But moreover, those tags and attributes for XHTML happen to be defined in all lowercase. That is what the specification, the language known as XHTML, defines the tags and attributes as all lowercase. A page can be well-formed and is well-formed if 
no matter what tags and attributes are in the page, the attributes at least have values flanked with quotes, and all tags are balanced. So I need to retract what I just said here. This is now well formed. Because even though blink and close blink are nicely balanced, those are not valid tags according to the XHTML spec. The nice thing, though, is that you yourself don't need to constantly be looking up in a book if some tag exists or some attribute exists. What you'll be able to do, for instance, is include a link on your page or visit a website that allows you to, with a single click, check if your web page contains valid XHTML or valid CSS. In fact, at the bottom of the E1 website have always been these two links sort of the W3Cs, the World Wide Web Consortium, which we've mentioned in the past, their you know, endorsement of our web page. Well, all that really means is that if we haven't messed up the web page in recent days, if you click this link, the page will automatically be analyzed for correctness. If you click this link, it will automatically have its CSS uh, validated, checked for correctness. I am not going to click them on them during lecture because too often I've messed up the web page before class and we have a big glaring not valid XHTML. And since I've already not practiced what I preached once tonight, I think we won't do that demonstration. But perhaps the most uh, overzealous student will race home and see if we do have some mistakes there. But we'll conclude tonight with some features not of static web page development, which is what we've been focusing on, but more dynamism. Because notice what we've been doing all night. Every time we want to make a change, what have I been doing? In just very real terms. Every time I propose that we change a feature of the website, what do we do? Right. We go into that dot page. We edit the source code, as it's called. We save it. We go back to the browser. We refresh. Well, consider a simple example. Suppose you wanted to embed on your web page the current date. That would be quite the burden to take upon yourself to wake up or to be awake at midnight every night so as to update your web page and change the date for the next day. Even worse, suppose it had a clock on it. I mean, that does not scale very well. But there are abilities in the design of web pages to dynamically change the content of your website. One means by which you can do this is something called SSI, or Server Side Includes. These are a feature of certain web servers, particularly those running on Unix or Linux, that allow you to embed what look like tags, but whose results are generated the moment someone visits the page. That is to say, if you embed these two lines in your XHTML on the web server, what you'll see when a user visits your page is the date and time that your page was last modified without having to change it yourself. If instead you paste into your XHTML this, you can inform the user what their IP address is. If you paste this into your web page, you can inform them what the current date is. If you paste this into your web page, you can tell them what browser they are using. If you paste this in, you can actually include the contents of another file altogether. So if you want to have some common footer, for instance, on every one of your web pages, just like with CSS, you don't want to paste that footer into every HTML page again and again, because updating it then becomes a pain. So rather, you can use server-side includes, SSI tokens, as these things are called, to say, at this point in my file, my XHTML file, load the contents of footer.html and automatically paste them here. So that if you ever want to change the footer of your page, the copyright information, the border at the bottom, you just change it in one place. We can see the results of these things by visiting ssi.html. In ssi.html, you see an example of all the stuff we just looked at. This is just a summary of what each of these tokens do. What I'm going to do is click the blue link at the top, which is going to show you what happens if you include these tokens in your own XHTML pages. So notice this is the before, what you have in your lecture slides. If you actually load these tokens into your XHTML and then let a user visit your web page, you see this. All of those tokens, upon being visited by a user, change into what they should be doing. We 
just realized that my laptop here tonight has this IP address. Notice what it used to be say there. It used to just generically say this. But when you actually visit a web page containing that tag, it actually tells them their IP address. Kind of boring here, but kind of scary if you flank that IP address with, hey, I just logged your IP address and know where you're coming from. Moreover, you could say, I also know that you are using a Windows XP using Internet Explorer 6.0. Now, it's a little cryptic, as many things have been tonight, but this string here, this phrase, is known by computer people in the world to mean Windows XP, which is little more than Windows NT version 5.1. MSIE 6.0 is IE6. And then Mozilla compatible just means it supports the standard that certain other browsers support. But we clearly have a date of September 20th, which means not the current date, but the date of last modification. So if it's useful to your web viewers to know when this page was last updated so that they can immediately leave it if nothing has changed since they last visited, train, I think we've determined, uh, you can simply embed that token rather than manually recording when you last updated the page. And of course, now we visited this page at 7.23. Those are SSIs, and the FAS web server does, in fact, support those. It's not the only way you can create dynamic effects on a web page. Using something called DHTML, you can combine XHTML with CSS with a language called JavaScript which we'll see in a couple of week or two's time, which is a programming language. And how many of you roughly around Halloween visited the E1 website and saw those flying bats? OK, so those of you who saw the flying bats, that was an effect, a dynamic effect, created by dynamic HTML, DHTML, which is just the collective use of these three technologies, two of which we've discussed tonight, the other of which we'll discuss in the future. Yet another way of creating dynamic web pages is to use something called CGI, Common Gateway Interface. We're diving now into verbally more uh, the realm of the slightly more technically savvy, sort of seasoned webmasters and web developers. CGI is what the E1 website uses to dynamically generate its pages so that we do not, again, update XHTML very often. We use a web interface to change the page and send announcements. We use a web interface to change grades and so forth. Everything is done dynamically. We don't manually change files because it's simply easier to use certain tools that we've developed instead of manually changing code. This is just a snippet of what the index file actually looks like for the E1 website, very unlike the HTML files we've seen tonight. But CGI, again, is just a technology with which you can dynamically produce output, ASP is another one. And I'm intentionally rattling these off because we will not be spending time in class, this class, on CGI, ASPs. These are topics that you can learn in something like Computer Science E12 at the Extension School, which is uh, web development and so forth. But this is just a quick glimpse at what's called an active server page, which is a Microsoft technology. And it's essentially the Windows equivalent of CGI, where CGI tends to be used more on Unix and Linux computers. You might have heard of JSPs. Java server pages. These are just like these other examples we've seen, just tools with which you can dynamically generate web pages, but these are written in the language called Java. We now speak Greek. We'll see you next week. <laughs>